So let's review last week really quickly. Again, last week uh, we talk, we're moving on to interpretation, right? So we've been talking about the inductive Bible study method. Basically that we make observations about the text, then we interpret what the text means, and then we apply the text to our lives. That's kind of the big grid that we're working with. A few weeks ago we talked about observation, that we get just the kind of raw materials uh, of the text, and we've been moving on to interpretation and actually finding out what uh, those raw materials mean. Last week we talked about the first two C's. Uh, we talked about content, so uh, figuring out when we have questions during our observation stage, if there are words that we don't know, people that we don't know, uh, or just things we don't understand, figuring out what, what those mean. And, we, and then we talked about context. Remember we talked about putting the text that we're reading uh, in the proper context of where it falls uh, in the Bible. So uh, New Testament, Old Testament, and we, we talked about working our way outward from the verse to the section that we were talking about, to the chapter, to the book, and then to the whole Bible. And we wanted to make sure that we found the original meaning of the text first, so that we didn't automatically interpret it as if it was written to us. We interpret it as it was intended to the original audience at the original time by the original author. So that's kind of what we covered last week. Before we start, is there any questions about last week that we need to clear up before we move forward? Nope. Okay. This week we're going to move on and we're going to spend the entire uh, lesson talking about the third C of comparison. So, before we get started, I kind of wanted to just illustrate this for you. So, here's the, here's the question I have to ask. Am I a tall man or a short man? Go ahead, Nancy. Compare to what? <laughs> Just, general, am, I tall, am I a tall man or a short man? You're tracking with me because I'm not the not the that point anymore. In between, you're neither. <laughs> neither? Okay. You guys know who Shaquille O'Neal is? Shaq? Yeah. yeah. If Shaq was standing beside me, am I a tall man or a short man? Short, short man. Short, very short man, huh? Um, any of you guys remember Muggsy Bugs? Yeah. Yeah. If Muggsy Bugs was standing beside me, am I a tall man or a short man? Tall. I'm a tall man, right? So. How do you know whether I'm a tall man or a short man? Well, you know I'm a tall whether I'm a tall man or a short man because in your lifetime, right, you've probably seen thousands of other men, and you have in your mind this frame of reference of what an average size man is. Right? You compare, and so you compare my height to that height that you've seen throughout your life. Right? That's how you know if I'm tall or short. But that's kind of what we're talking about today. We're talking about comparison, right? You've seen thousands of men so you know uh, how tall I am based on the comparison you make between me and the other men that you know. That makes sense? So comparison is a, a skill we all have. Uh, we use it every day, right? So you're driving down the street. Um, so if, if you're driving out kind of towards Hickory on Star Town Road, they've just built this just gigantic house sitting on the top of a hill. It's like a big white house. You see it from miles away. And every time we drive by it, Chance like, wow, that's a huge house. Well, how do we know it's a huge house? Well, because we compare it to the other houses that are right around it. We compare it to other houses we've seen. Right? We watch, my wife and I watch House Hunters all the time, and we're like, <laughs> what? You have a $900,000 budget for your house? That's ridiculous. What do you do for a living? So, yeah. <laughs> right, summer home. Um, but we see those things, and we say, wow, that's a really nice house. And how do we know that? We compare it to other houses we've seen. You go to your favorite restaurant. You get your favorite meal. Well, how do you know it's your favorite meal? Because you compare it to the other meals that you've had, and of all the other meals you've had, it's your favorite meal. That makes sense. Comparison is, you do it all the time. Again, when we're talking about the inductive Bible study method, a lot of what we're doing is simply stuff we do all the time. We're just directing it towards the Bible and helping it, and using it to help us make sense of the Bible. So comparison gives us a frame of reference to know what we should think about something. That makes sense? So you should know how tall I am based on how you compare me to everyone else. When we come to the Bible, we're going to do the similar thing. Right? We're going to use comparison and comparison tools to help us reference other texts in the Bible to tell us what we should really, what we should really think about a certain passage of Scripture. So, let's see, moving on. So here the, we're going to talk about three different comparison uh, kind of tools and techniques today. Uh, they are cross-references, concordance, uh, and scripture memory. 
So each of these is a yeah, a technique or a tool that we can use to help us compare a, a passage that we're looking at to other passages of Scripture to help us uh, kind of get an idea of what we're, what we're talking about. So these are the three we're going to go through. Now, these, these three are, we're not really going to go into the, the deep kind of why questions, why we do these. These are really practical. All right, so we're, we're literally just going to look at these in terms of uh, how they can help us make comparisons. As you continue to do these, you continue to use cross-references, concordances, right? You, these are the things you get better at as you keep using them. Um, but we're just going to kind of give the basic uh, things. And I'm sure you guys have used these before, probably. Um, but these are what we're going to go through today. So let's begin with cross-references. Right. Has anybody here used cross-references before? Yeah? Good. Well, what is a cross-reference? I always thought you couldn't use the definite or the word, part of the word in the definition, but this was the one I found. So. A cross reference is a reference to another text uh, or part of a text typically given to elaborate on a point. So basically, what a cross reference is, right? A cross reference is a, uh, it will refer you to somewhere else that will help you explain what you're looking at currently. Does that make sense? That's a cross reference. So, where can we find cross-references? Well, did you guys have cross-references in your Bible? Right? You did? So, you can find them in your Bible. A lot of times they're found kind of either in the middle column or sometimes they're at the bottom. You can find those uh, in your Bible. My Bible actually doesn't have cross-references in it. Um, so, if I was looking for cross-references, I'd have to look somewhere else. I brought a few examples today of, of these uh, places where we can find these. You can find cross-references in a study Bible or a reference Bible. Okay? So this is a study Bible that, um, as you can see, there are cross-references down the middle column. Uh, sometimes if you go to the Christian bookstore, you can find uh, just reference Bibles that will have, they won't have notes, but they'll have cross-references in them. You can find them on a Bible app. All right, I know we're getting in the tech-savvy world right now. Um, I'm going to show you the one that I use for cross-references. Um, so I use the ESV Bible app. So if you have a tablet or a smartphone, right, and there's plenty of these apps, this is just the kind of one I use. But what I can do if I'm studying Matthew 5, right, I can just hit the thing and it'll bring up all the cross-references. This is really helpful if you're, um, you know, if flipping through is taking you a while or you just want to quickly look up a reference or something. Um, this is what I use when I'm prepping for this class. You can get it on your tablet or on your phone. Uh, and then you can also look on the internet. So, right, Google, best invention ever. Um, you can go online and just type in Matthew 4, 1 through 11 cross references. And you'll, it'll probably direct you to a, a Bible uh, software or something, something like that to give you these cross references. So that's where you can find them, right? So it's, it's really easy to find cross references and you should be able to find them um, really easy. So once you've found them, now the question is, how do you use them? All right. So we're going to go through an example. Uh, go ahead and take your Bibles out and let's flip to Matthew chapter four. So what we're going to do with cross references, you're going to uh, find the cross reference. All right. So a lot of times each verse will have multiple cross references. So we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11 today, and I've, I've picked a few specific cross-references out to kind of illustrate my point. Um, but if you're reading along something and you find something that you don't understand, you can say, okay, well, I'm going to see what the Bible, where, where else this kind of theme is in the Bible, and read the cross-reference. And so what, what you're going to ask yourself when you're finding these cross-references is you're going to go to the cross-reference, read that reference, and, and ask yourself, what does this tell me about the passages that I'm reading? Okay, how does this help me interpret or understand the, the passage that I'm actually reading? And this, you can get this in many ways, right? So cross-references cross -references can help you understand themes. Right? So sometimes a cross-reference will reference you to something that's not exactly talking about the same thing, but the theme is similar. Sometimes cross-references will uh, give you definitions. 
Sometimes if you want to find, remember last week we talked about content questions, if there are people that you don't know, so you get to Hebrews and you, you get to the, the part about Melchizedek like we talked about last week, you find the cross-reference and it'll take you right to the other portions of Scripture that talk about that same person. It can give you uh, definitions and, and teach you who people are. So let's uh, go to, again, Matthew 4. All right, we all know this uh, section probably. This is the section when... Uh, Jesus is tempted uh, in the uh, in the wilderness, and I, I chose this passage for a reason because I think it illustrates well um, what kind of tying in what we talked about last week with what we talked about this week. So we're going to tie in these content questions and context questions uh, with Matthew chapter four as we're looking at the cross references. All right. So does anybody have a cross reference? Anybody have cross references with them right now? In there? Bible. Mm-hmm. Mine says Mark 1 12 and Luke 4 1 for the temptation of Christ. Okay. What about what about for verse 2? Does anybody have a cross reference to Deuteronomy from Deuteronomy 9 9? Deuteronomy Alright, so let's do this. Let's put our finger in Matthew 4 and flip <coughs> back to Deuteronomy 9 9. All the way back. Now, again, remember last week we uh, we were talking about context. Okay, when you use cross references, one of the reasons why you did context first is when you use cross references, it's really important that you get the context right. Because so just by flipping those pages in your Bible, you're going back thousands of years to a completely different group of people. Jesus is not on the scene yet. Right, a lot of stuff hasn't happened. And so we're going to a completely different context. So we've got to keep that in mind as we use the cross-references. The Deuteronomy 9, 9. It says this. When I went up, up the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that the Lord made with you, I remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. Okay, so how does that cross-reference help us understand verse 2 of Matthew 4. What, is the, what are the similarities you see in Matthew 4, 2 and, Matthew, and Deuteronomy 9, 9? 40 days Okay, there's 40 days and 40 nights. Hungry. Okay. No water or Hungry. No food or water, okay. You see how that connection gets made there? All right, let's go down and we're going to look at the cross-references for all the times that Jesus cites uh, Deuteronomy. Okay, so verse 4. Deuteronomy 8.3. Okay, Deuteronomy 8.3. So, so Matthew 4.4. 4, Jesus says, but he answered him, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay, that's the verse we're looking at in Matthew. Deuteronomy 8.3. I want to volunteer to read Deuteronomy 8 3. Do we have any brain on the story? It says, And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with mouth, which you did not know, nor did your father know, that he might make you the man, <coughs> make you now that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Okay. So obviously, that's a direct citation, right? Jesus is directly citing that, that passage. All right, let's go back to Matthew 4 again. Let's cross-reference, let's see here. Um, let's cross-reference verse 7. Okay? One, one, just a side note, one cool thing about cross-references, especially if you use the, the app, one of the reasons I like using the app is... Um, if it's a direct citation, a lot of times the, the cross-reference will say cited from and then give you the citation. And that way you'll know, oh, this is a direct quote. So, uh, same thing. So Deuteronomy 6.16. Six, Pretty simple. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. All right, so again, we have a direct quote there. And if we go back again to Matthew 4 and cross-reference verse 10, 
we'll see that side from Deuteronomy 6.13. It says, It is the Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. Okay, so we've done the cross-references. So obviously, if we're reading this passage and we've done the cross-references, we see that Deuteronomy chapters 6 through 9 are pretty important. There's a direct uh, correlation that Jesus is trying to make from Deuteronomy to this time in Matthew when he's being tempted. So, I don't know if you guys have heard this passage taught before, and I have heard it taught this way. One of the ways I've heard Matthew 4 taught before is if you're being tempted or if you feel temptation of some sort, so whatever your particular sin struggle is, if you feel temptation, what you need to do is combat, uh, combat that temptation with Scripture. Okay? You see where that would be the interpretation we get from this passage in Matthew 4? So Jesus is tempted, and Jesus answers back citing Scripture. Okay? Is that a bad interpretation of the text? Maybe not. Maybe not a bad application. But when we get when we dig down, we see that this that Jesus is referencing back to Deuteronomy six through nine. We can learn a lot more about the meaning of the passage by referring back to those texts. Okay. So bring it all together. Context: Who is Matthew writing to? Primarily Jews are going to be reading Matthew's writing. So think about this. You're a good Jew. You've been, you've grown up, and you've you know read the Old Testament. And you get to verse 2 of Matthew 4. And it says, After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Okay? What's the other? Light bulb. Right? What's going what's gonna to come to your mind as a good Jew if you read that? You're probably going to think back to Deuteronomy 6. Or you might think back to when Israel was wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. You see that? You see how that connection is going to make? Now you, you miss that if you don't if you're not knowing if you don't know the context. If you don't know the context that primarily Jews are going to be reading this, that primarily Jews would have read the Old Testament, and the Old Testament would be the background information for Matthew 4. But that connection probably would have, you know, think about it, if you're if you've grown up in a Jewish household, that's probably the first connection you're going to make. Then you start to read through Matthew 4, and you see all these places where Moses had given, given commandments to Israel back in Deuteronomy, all through. And usually, uh, this is kind of the, the uh, theme of the Old Testament is, right? God tells Israel to do something, and then they don't do it. Right? And then God's like, okay, well, come back to me. And they come back for a while, and he tells them to do something else, and then they don't do it. And tell them to do something else, and it's just kind of this repeating thing. The point being that Israel pretty much always fails when they're given a direct command. Right? They, they always come up short. Well, we see Jesus here quoting these passages that Moses had given to Israel. And where Israel had failed, right? Israel had fallen to those temptations and not done those things, Jesus perfectly fulfilled those. Right? Jesus uh, had not given in to the temptation like Israel had. So think about this. If you're a good Jew, you know that one, the 40, 40 days and nights is going to jog your memory. Also, these passages from Deuteronomy are going to jog, you know, are going to probably come to mind because Jesus is citing them. And then the point of Matthew 4, right, being that Jesus succeeded in these things where Israel had failed. Which means, right, that Jesus perfectly fulfilled the Old Testament requirements of God perfectly fulfilled the law, and he should be the one to whom the Jews should be looking to for their salvation. Does that make sense? Do you see how logically we got there? It can kind of seem kind of all over the place. But if you put it all together, right, this is where you've got to know content, you've got to know what you're working with, you've got to know the context, right, that's where it's helpful to know who Matthew's writing to, right, who Moses is writing to, in Deuteronomy. You see those things? You see how that, that helped? And so, we went from use, uh, use scripture to fight your temptations as the ultimate meaning of that text. Which again, that's a good application. I'm not saying that's a bad application. Again, but we want to wait to get to that until we really understand the text. 
So we went from just that being kind of the simple reading of the text that we would kind of get if we're thinking, oh, Jesus used scripture, I should use scripture. Well, now we get it and we say, wow, Jesus fulfilled the place in the Old Testament where Israel failed. Therefore, he's the Messiah that the Old Testament should be looking to. Therefore, he's the Messiah for, the, for these Jews that are getting this letter written to them. <clears throat> then the application is, first of all, well, I should believe in him as the Messiah. And then, yes, when you're in temptation, knowing Scripture helps you. Right? Knowing Scripture allows you to fight temptation, but that doesn't end up being the ultimate meaning of the text. Does that make sense? All right, let's stop here and take any questions. So it's not always going to be like this cut and dry. I picked this example for a reason, but just... You know, it's pretty, pretty easy to see the connection. Any questions about cross-referencing? I think an observation is that it shows a continuity from Old Testament to New Testament. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about uh, application, it applied back then. It applies just the same today. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So... Again, last week we talked about context of, of figuring out where your where your text that you're reading fits in with the entire, you know, passage of the, of the scriptures, and knowing that Genesis gives us the beginning, Revelation gives Revelation gives us the end, and everything else falls somewhere in between this part of the of the Bible, so to speak, and so knowing that this passage in the New Testament correlates and connects back to this passage in the Old Testament. That can help us figure out, better figure out our applications. Yeah, that's really good. Anything else before we move forward on cross-references? Okay. So those are cross-references. Cross-references are really helpful. I remember when I first became a Christian, I, I had no idea how to read the Bible. Um, and as I started to read, one of the most helpful things for me was when somebody taught me how to use cross-references. Because then I started to connect dots and figure out that this wasn't, you know, Matthew wasn't just this kind of standalone letter that I had to interpret only by Matthew, but that I could, you know, figure out what Matthew meant through, through other passages. And again, we use cross-references, a practical way to use cross-references is to use them in the same way we used the grid last week. So if you look up a cross-reference, and there's a cross-reference that says, okay, you're in Matthew 4.11, there's a cross-reference that says verse 13, it talks about the same thing. Use that in close cross-reference first, and then work your way out. I skipped straight to Deuteronomy because I didn't have time to go through all of them. But if you work your, it, that can help you work your way out as well. Does that make sense? All right. So there's our example. Okay, moving forward. Using a concordance. Have you guys used concordances before? All right. So what is a concordance? A concordance is a collection of words and an alphabetical list that are present in a text with citations to passages where those words are found. Okay? Simply put, a concordance is just a list of words and where they happen in, in whatever text you're looking at. Okay? That's a concordance. So, where can you find a concordance? Alright, most Bibles have this, I feel like. Maybe not. But if you flip to the back of your Bible, odds are you'll have a concordance of some sort back there. It, it might be a simple one, a really easy one with just kind of major words that you need to know. But you can find those uh, in your Bible or in a study Bible, right? Like we talked about. Most Bibles now, I think most Bibles nowadays have at least some form of concordance in the back. You can also find a concordance, grab this one from Pastor Josh's office. You can find a concordance in book form. All right, so if you want to look really smart, carry this for the coffee shop and do your Bible study. All right, so this has the, all the words in really small print that you need a magnifying glass to read. Um, you can find them in book form. All right, another handy thing about uh, this app that I was talking about earlier is that there's also built-in concordance. All right, that's one of the great things about technology is that it makes it really lazy, but makes it really easy, okay? So let's say I want to find... Last week we talked about uh, sanctification. I think that's the example we're going to use. Right, so I find this word sanctification and I want to find all the other places where that word is mentioned in the Bible. Right, so go to my handy Bible app, type it in sanctification, and it brings up a list of all the places where that word is used. Okay, 
Again, this is, makes things really easy and really simple and really fast to do that. And again, you can get, there's plenty of these apps around. That's just the one I use because it's the same translation as the Bible. Uh, but you can get it on your tablet, you can get it on your smartphone, in multitude of places. And push comes to shove, you can get it online. Right? So you can just, there's a, uh, really if you go to Google, just type in concordance, click on it, just make sure uh, you're in the right translation and you can find your words that you're looking for. So a note about concordances. You're going to want to make sure that the concordance you use is the same translation as the Bible you use. Okay? So this concordance is for the KJV. Right? So some of the words that are in this concordance won't be in my Bible because I have a different translation. Again, we're having an app that's the same translation. It's easy, but um, you want to just make sure if you get so if you're you know if you're in NIV or ESV or whatever translation. Don't go to the store and spend 40 bucks on a concordance that's a different translation, right? Because the words, some of the words are different. And you're going to want to make sure that you know you're going to pull up sanctification and it might not be in the same verse you're even reading because it's a different translation. So that's where you can find them. Now the question is, well, how do we use them? All right. Last week we talked about First Thessalonians four. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Right? So, remember in our observation stage, we said, okay, sanctification, that's an important word. I should probably figure out what that means, but I don't know what it means. Then we get to the content questions of, okay, I need to figure out what sanctification means before I move forward. I need to know what I'm, what I'm working with. Well, how do you do that? Well, one of the ways you can answer that content question is by using a concordance. Alright, so you... Do the search, sanctification, and send you to 2 Thessalonians 2.13, which says, But we ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in truth. Okay, so there's that word, sanctification. Again. Now, how does this help us understand what sanctification means? Well, Sanctification by the Spirit. One thing we can deduce is that sanctification comes by the Spirit. So it's something that the Spirit does. So that might not answer all of our questions of what sanctification is, but it does give us a piece. Right? It gives us a, a helpful piece to know sanctification happens through the Spirit. And that, that will give you um, at least a next step in the process of how do you figure out what that word means. Okay, so this shows us that the Spirit, we need the Spirit to sanctify. Well, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual morality. Some connection that you would have to make there is the way you fight sexual immorality is going to be somehow through the Spirit, by the Spirit. Does that make sense? So again, you look up these, um, these word studies and this concordance, and it can help give you an idea of what you're talking about. All right, and again, you can find those book form, online forms. Okay, this is really helpful for words that are difficult, that aren't, you know, in your day-to-day -day grammar, that you can look for if you don't know what they mean. Or it can also help you find themes, right? So, um, let's just say you want to do... I don't know. If you want to find something for the will of God, we might look up the word will. That might be a difficult one because there's a lot of other ones like that. But you might look up a word that you're wanting to find that happens, and if you see, oh, this word happens a lot. And maybe you find, oh, this word happens a lot in 1 Peter. So maybe 1 Peter has a point that he wants to tell us about this. Um, you look up the word justification, and you find that justification happens a lot in the first five books of Romans. Okay, well, maybe Paul's trying to tell us in the first five books of Romans something about justification. Does that make sense? Any questions about using concordance? No? It's pretty, pretty self-explanatory, but can be really helpful, especially when you're trying to figure out words. Lastly, scripture memory. All right, I need a brave volunteer. A really brave volunteer. Come on, somebody. Dylan, 
Dylan. <laughs> yes. Dylan, who's your favorite? Uh, who's your favorite musical artist? You know this one. All right. Good. Lecrae. Lecrae. All right. What's your favorite Lecrae song? Tell the world. Tell the world. Tell the world about Lecrae. How's the chorus of that song go? Uh. <laughs> um. I forget. <laughs> Come on, man, you're ruining my example right now. <laughs> Give me a line from that song. Um, tell the world I'm black. I got it right over here on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to totally destroy my example, by the way. Alright, moving on. Um, Anyone else have any favorite songs? Right? Favorite songs? Come on, I know you got some favorite songs. In Christ Alone. In Christ Alone. How's the chorus of that song go? What's the, what's just, what's the, you don't have to sing, but what's the, if you, if you, <laughs> you want, want to sing, if you want to sing, you can't. You don't want me to sing. <laughs> what are the words? Christ alone, my hope is found. Okay, there we go. Christ alone, my hope is found. That's proof that we can do scripture here. Alright? So, this is really embarrassing. You might guys have seen that commercial for Sprint, right? It's got the Narwhal song in it, right? It's such a stupid commercial. Shannon and I have literally been walking around house singing that for like the last two weeks. It came off. Right, and I can remember narwhal, narwhal, so I'm in the ocean, right? I can remember the words to it. Okay, I'm using that as a silly example. We can do scripture memory, right? The first response when we talk about scripture memory is, I can't do scripture memory, I don't remember things well. Well, yeah, you do. You remember things okay if they're things you want to remember. The reason why we, here's the reason why we don't do scripture memory. One, it takes time, okay? The reason why we can remember song lyrics is probably because we've listened to that song a hundred times. All right? You probably know in Christ alone because you not only stood but sang it a hundred times. All right? It takes work. All right? You got to sit down, kind of turn the TV off, lock off all sound, and actually study the passage. And it requires that we slow down and focus. Right? We can do songs because they they're kind of catchy. Right? They get stuck in our head when we start singing about narwhals in the shower. Right? Um, but we got to slow down and focus on what we're wanting to do. Now, why do I put scripture memory in the comparison section? Well, sometimes when you get to certain texts, this is another reason I use Matthew 4 today as an example, verses that you know might not necessarily be cross-references to the exact verse that you're looking at. Okay? So I use Matthew 5.17 as an example. So, when I first became a Christian, I had a guy, this is ridiculous, but he said, all right, guys, we're going to memorize the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> Again, I've been a Christian for like six months, right? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Memorize several now. So, right, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I got about halfway through Matthew 5. This is about where I ended uh, with my scripture memory. But um, this was a verse that, that I memorized early on when I, was, when I was a Christian. Matthew 5, 17. Not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Okay? Now, Matthew 5, 17 did not show up as a cross-reference for us today in our passage when we're looking at Matthew 4. But, when I was looking at Matthew 4, I remembered Matthew 5, 17. So that when I'm, you know, when I'm looking at the cross-references and I'm seeing that Jesus is fulfilling all these areas where Israel failed, this verse comes to my mind. I did not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. All right, Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament. Now, that's not, again, that's not going to come up as a direct cross-reference in your passage. But if you've got verses memorized, a lot of times that's easy connections that you can make and help you understand about what the passage that you're talking about. Now, there's a million other reasons why we should do Scripture memory. And we're going to talk about those in the coming weeks. Uh, but one just very practical reason Scripture memory is beneficial is that it helps us to quickly have references in our heads stored in our mind that we can quickly bring up when we're reading the Bible. Also, if you're reading a long passage of scripture, so if you're doing the Bible study reading plan, and you've got three chapters you've got to read that day, odds are you're not going to sit with cross-references and cross-reference every verse that you read, right? But as you're reading, if you've got some scripture memory verses that are stored in your head, you get halfway through a chapter and you think, oh, that makes me think of, let me make sure I at least go look in that one, at that one. And that will maybe help me understand what I'm reading. Does that make sense? All right. We got three minutes left. Pretty good. I got good time. Um, three minutes left for any questions. All 
All right, let me give you some of the logic behind why we went in the order we went in. So last week we talked about content and context. This week we talked about comparison. Next week we're going to be talking about culture and consultation. Here's why we did this. I think my, gut, my natural response when I go to study the Bible is I read it and then I immediately go see what my favorite pastor says about it or what Clint says about it or what anybody else would say about it. And that's fine. If there are guys you trust that can help you understand, it's perfectly fine. The reason why we did the order we went in is, as you can see, the first three C's that we've been talking about keep us in the scriptures for the most part. Now you can use some commentaries to help you find some contextual things, and, and that's fine. But for the most part, we're, we're sticking in the scriptures for the first three C's of interpretation. And that's intentional. Because, again, just in the same way like we're waiting to the very end to do application, I think we, we should probably kind of wait a little while in our interpretation to go see what someone else thinks about it. Because we want to compare the scriptures to the scriptures first. Because that's the best way that we can help interpret the scriptures is by the scriptures. Right? One of the uh, tenets of Christianity is that we believe the Bible is inerrant and that it all connects. There's no errors. You can find out what you need to know about life and godliness in the Bible. And so we want to make sure that we do those connections first. Also, side note, so I, asked, I, I sent uh, Michael White a message and said, anything you would want to add to this? And he, he brought up a good point. Say you get to a passage of scripture like 1 Corinthians 13 that you have no idea what it means, and it's really odd. You know, like, just kind of way out there, what does this mean? And it references another passage that's a little easier to understand. We always want to interpret the more difficult passages by the simpler passages, right? So the basic, what we can get clearly from the Bible, right, the clear teaching, we always want to interpret the, the kind of Difficult teaching that is really hard to understand by the simpler. Does that make sense? So, again, that's just a nugget from Michael White. But, and if you have a question about that, go ask it. <laughs> but we always want to interpret the more difficult passages by the simpler passages. Determine the ones that are a little unclear by the ones that are crystal clear. And that will help you get proper interpretations. All right. Next week, we're going to be moving on to the final two C's of interpretation uh, and we will be kind of wrapping up interpretation.